will not be questioned by any Protestant who has a competent knowledge of history. All you've got to do is go to Europe and tour some of the churches. I've been there. You can do it in South America too because they even had some of the churches had these places where they had implements of torture under the church. And they say, come on down, pay a fee, we'll show you. And you can see the dungeons and the, the torture chambers. And it is just a fact of history. So, does the papacy fit that criteria that we read about of being a persecuting power? Yes, yes it does. Evidence F. It would emerge from the fourth kingdom of iron, pagan Rome. Did uh, the papacy come up from the Roman Empire? Yes, it came up right from the seat. Goes on to say in Revelation 17, verse 13, the waters that you saw are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. And with the swipe of a pen, Constantine basically made the Roman power ruled by the emperors, the Roman emperor, empire ruled by a church. And it suddenly went from iron to iron and clay. Clay in the Bible is what God made man of. It's a symbol for religion there. It's not just a political power. It tells us that the papacy arose from the center of civilization. This is just all through the history books. Answer G. We go on to learn God's people or the saints would be given into his hand for a time and a times and the dividing of time. That's three and a half years. And it goes on again in Revelation chapter 13, verse 5. All power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Well, does the church fit that uh, criteria? The legally recognized supremacy of the Pope began in 538 A.D. when there went into effect a decree of Emperor Justinian making the Bishop of Rome head over all the churches, the definer of doctrine, and the corrector of heretics. Paul, in one of his letters, he writes to the church and he says, your brethren in Babylon. Do well, you think he was talking about ancient Babylon that was swallowed up by the desert? They were already beginning to call Rome Babylon at that time. The church recognized it symbolically as Babylon. Again, you can read, Villages ascended the papal chair 538 A.D. under the military protection of Be uh, Belisarius. That's history of the Christian church. Now, it tells you in prophecy, I have given you a day for a year. Uh, there are several examples of that in prophecy. Not only do you find that in, in Numbers, you find it in Ezekiel. I think I quoted to you from Luke chapter 13, where Jesus used that principle, where he said, Go tell Herod that fox I do cures and cast out devils and perform miracles. Today, tomorrow, and the third day I will be completed. Another example of a day for a year in prophecy. It says that this power would hold uninterrupted sway from 538 to 1798. And we've already seen that they were clearly established, a good starting point there at 538 A.D. If you go, not 1,260 days, a day is a year in prophecy, so you go 1,260 what? Years, what does that take us to? 1798. What was happening in 1798 around the world? Anyone remember this character? The little general, little corporal they called him, Napoleon. His armies were sweeping across Europe into northern Africa and fed up with the abuses of the church and because a Frenchman had been murdered in Rome they used that as an excuse to take the Pope captive. Matter of fact I've got that. It's right here out of the history book. 1798 Berthier. He was the, Roman, or the French general. He made his entrance into Rome, abolished the papal government and established a secular one. From that time in 538 until 1798 they held virtually uninterrupted control over these kingdoms of Europe. The kings could really not do very much without the approval of the church. And they had advisors in every court. Letter H. It would speak great words of blasphemy against the Most High God. Now, what is blasphemy? Now, we're not going to use it like if you're using irreverent language in a bar. What's the Bible definition of blasphemy? There are two scriptural definitions for blasphemy. First one is claiming to forgive sin. And the second one is claiming the prerogatives of God, claiming to be God. And it tells us that this beast power, Revelation 13, verse 6, he opens his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name. And again, in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, 
so that he sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God. Let me say something about this right here. Some people think because of that verse I just read that the beast power is going to sit in the temple of God. They say, well, the temple was destroyed in 70 AD. In order for the beast to sit in the temple of God, they must be rebuilding the temple of God. That is a terrible misunderstanding of Scripture. The Bible tells us in the New Testament, what don't you know that ye are the temple of God? Christ said, destroy this temple made with hands, in three days I'll raise it up. What was he talking about? His body. The church is the body of Christ. And so when it says this beast power sits in the temple of God showing himself that he is God, it's talking about the devil infiltrates the church and puts himself in the position of God and claims the prerogatives of God. It's not talking about a building somewhere. And yet how many times have you heard on TV evangelists say, yep, they're going to rebuild the temple over there. They're going to bulldoze the dome with a rock. And you know what kind of war that would create? I mean, right now the Pope just makes a bad sentence and look at the furor that's caused by it. What do you think is going to happen if they go in there with bulldozers and demolish the Mosque of Omar? That's not the temple it's talking about. That's why the whole world is confused about these issues. It's a big diversionary tactic. The devil has got everybody looking down this way. He's coming up from behind. Happening right under their noses. It's happening now and everybody's looking for this beast that uh, is not where he's, they think he is. The Bible gives us a definition for blasphemy. John 10, 33. The Jews answered Jesus and said, For a good work we're not stoning you, but for blasphemy, because you, being a man, make yourself God. When a man puts himself in the place of God, what does the Bible call that? Blasphemy. Now, some quotes from the Catholic Church's own statements. We, the popes, hold upon this earth the place of God Almighty. That's a complete quote there. Pope Leo the 13th. Again, the supreme teacher in the church is the Roman pontiff. Union of minds, therefore, requires together with perfect accord in the one faith, complete submission and obedience to the will of the church and to the Roman pontiff as to God himself. I think that's stretching it, friends, when a man says you need to obey this, technically he's a pastor of the church, as God himself. What's the other definition for blasphemy? We just read it a second ago. It's uh, claiming to have the ability to forgive sins. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, Who is this that speaks blasphemy? Speaking of Jesus, who can forgive sins but God alone? And they were right. God and God only can forgive sins. Does the church claim to have that power? Pope Leo the Thirteenth again. This is our last lesson to you. Receive it. Engrave it in your minds, all of you. By God's commandment, salvation is to be found nowhere but in the church. The strong and effective instrument of salvation is none other than the Roman pontificate. The only way you can be saved. You know, if you would delete those words and put in Jesus, it would be okay. That would be a great statement. But when you put in an earthly power and in individuals, that's taking the prerogatives of God. Again, dignities and duties of the priest. God himself is obliged to abide by the judgment of his priests and either to pardon, either not to pardon or pardon according as they refuse or give absolution. The sentence of the priest precedes and God subscribes to it. The priests are deciding who is forgiven and who is not forgiven. That means if you get someone who's got the office of a priest and he's cranky or inebriated, you're doomed. I'd be terrible to give that kind of power to a man. Answer I, it would think to change times and laws. A few quotes. The Pope has power, these are from their own writings, to change times, to abrogate laws, and to dispense with all things, even the precepts of Christ. Now they believe, and you know, one of the things I love about America is you're free to believe whatever you want to believe. That's wonderful. I've been in countries where they don't have that freedom. It is so nice that if you want to smear yourself with molasses and sit on a hill of ants in America, you can do it. You know, it's a great place to live. Little history. What happened is gradually as the Roman power began to decline, the church in Rome began to grow. They wanted to make Christianity more and more attractive to the pagans in Rome. And so they thought, you know, in order to reach them, let's create